two royal stories, well, royal related stories I want to talk about before the end of the show. Martin Bashir, remember him? He's the BBC reporter behind that explosive 1995 Panorama interview with Princess Diana, in which, of course, she said explosively, there were three of us in this marriage. Well, he's now claimed that he's been the victim of racism at the BBC over the scandal over how he actually obtained that interview while yet more executives have left Harry and Meghan's Archwell production company. They just can't keep a member of staff. Well, talking to me about all of this right now is Royal Commentator Kinsey Schofield, who joins me now from Los Angeles. Hello, Kinsey. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Busy morning. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, this is more about a BBC story, but look, it relates to basically one of the biggest royal scoops ever. This is even bigger than the disastrous Prince Andrew interview on Newsnight uh, uh, about his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. But this, I mean, this this did change the course of you know our constitutional monarchy in the sense that you know this this interview prompted you know the the, the divorce of of Diana and Charles, the, the revelations about affairs and things being formally you know, admitted by members of the family. This panorama scoop in 1995 was huge. The world stopped to watch this interview. And there's been a huge scandal for years since about how Martin Bashir, who was a pretty junior reporter at the time at the BBC, got this interview. And basically, it was by hook or by crook. And now we're getting more and more investigations into what actually happened at the BBC, the cover-up, once people realise that he had basically lied to virtually everyone involved in, and, and, you know, created false documents to persuade Diana to talk to him. Um, he's now claiming that he is a victim of racism. He has said that it was professional jealousy uh, that, that prompted all the uh, criticism of him. It would have been so much easier, he said, if he was one of the dynastic Dimbleby brothers um, who'd carried out the interview. Uh, and that basically the issue was um, that he was, uh, the irritation was that he was a second generation immigrant of non-white working class roots that he should have the temerity to enter a royal palace. That was the issue. What do you make of those claims? I mean, while those are kind of the headlines, while those are what's stealing every, you know, that's what everybody's talking about, I was more taken aback by the words so-called forgery. He oh. says in these emails, so-called forgery. Well, we know today that there, it was a forgery. It absolutely was a forgery. And that he got the access to the princess um, through, you know, I think, malicious means. Uh, this was a woman that was highly paranoid. And while it might be a stretch to say that this could have been, been the beginning of the domino effect that caused her to lose her life in, in a Paris tunnel, it certainly made her anxious around the security that was provided to her by the palace. And it made her, I think it led to her distancing herself and inevitably uh, cutting them off and saying, I don't want this palace protection. And if she would have had palace protection, you know, some of her former royal protection officers agree that she might still be alive today. Yeah. So, you know, kind of smug to say, oh, they're just, they're professionally jealous of me and it's because of my skin tone. Um, but what a, in my opinion, what a, a liar to, yeah. to, to still be using the so-called forgery line. But, but exactly. And again, we've only got hold of these documents because of, you know, desperate legal bids to get the BBC to actually uh, publish these. And they've been massively redacted um, when, you know, BBC executives up to their eyeballs in, in cover-ups uh, around this. But again, playing, I mean, throwing out the race card, it seems to be so outrageous. It, it was, he was treated as a hero, this amazing scoop at the time. Um, and, you know, the, originally he probably wouldn't have got the scoop if he had done it the way, you know, yes, one of the Dimbleby brothers would have done it because they'd have been, the carpet would have been rolled out for them. It would be a decision by the palace to sort of, to, to, to help, you know, help them with that interview. But he did get it by hook or by crook. And it's widely accepted that what he did was outrageous and really, as you said, fed into Diana's paranoia, but also, I mean, why it actually justified some of it, her, her, her feeling that she couldn't trust anybody and that people were selling stories about her and people were giving stuff away. And that's, and we've seen, you know, the damage that that does to people when they feel they can't trust uh, the people closest to them. Um, so it is extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I don't think many people are going to believe this, but I also thought anyone of colour who's working at the BBC right now would feel really aggrieved at this, that someone is playing the race card when actually people aren't criticising him or judging him because of anything to do with his ethnicity or 
or, you know, a second generation immigrant, they're criticising him because what he did was profoundly wrong, probably illegal, I'm pretty sure it was, those sort of lies, um, and, uh, and completely against it with, 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 with no journalistic credibility. I mean, people are criticising him for what he said and what he did, not his skin colour. And can I just stress, I know a lot of people are looking at this going, gosh, this happened so long ago. Why are we talking about it? But this is the cover up of the cover up. Yeah. Uh, these words were typed out in an email in July of 2020. And I just want to keep in mind, if we're on, we're talking about racism in July of 2020, uh, you, the, the world was on fire, Julia. We were, uh, I believe we're in the midst of George Floyd, people taking to the streets. You know, that it, it's almost as if he was using he a was trigger campaign oh, yeah. to shut somebody down. He knew exactly what he was doing there. No time for that at all. Uh, tell you also, uh, they knew exactly what they're doing. All these executives leading the Archwell Foundation. This is the charitable foundation set up by Meghan and Harry, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. They don't seem to be able to keep their staff at all. Yes, well, in this particular instance, this is Bennett Levine, and he is he was a part of their entertainment aspect. There's charity, but they also have several different, you know, it's an umbrella where they also had an, an, an audio section so that they could produce, uh, you know, podcasts for from primarily Megan, it turned out, and then movies. And Bennett it was came from Sony, very talented young man. People were so excited about him. Um, and we found out that he left er, earlier this month. He announced it on LinkedIn. Um, I do think it's a reflection of their leadership. And I think the problem is they are managing to get really talented people. But people that come from structured backgrounds like Sony, where they have a template, they have a formula for what success is, and Harry and Meghan play by their own rules yeah. and, and but, but likely also, clash it's with not, people that it's come not, in. There's also some issues in terms of their personal uh, life as well, in terms of, you know, nannies and, and other, other staff and press officers uh, that PR, they don't seem to be able to keep a lot of these people around uh, for a very long time, which there have been some question marks about Meghan's treatment uh, of, of some of her, her staff as well, at Buckingham Palace and the like. But, but also there seems to be an issue, you know, an awful lot of the work that these people would have been, you know, brought in to, to oversee and to, to direct, well, it's not happening, is it? I mean, it's just that they're, they're losing Netflix and Spotify deals, you know, by the, by the handful. I agree, and it, it is about behavior. There, are, It's documented in numerous books, um, to Tom Bauer, Tom Quinn, and Valentine Lowe. But every time I mention that, I forget to mention Prince Harry in Spare. <laughs> he talks about one of their employees crying at her desk, uh, you know, in reaction to the way that they treated her. So Prince Harry, it's come out of his mouth as yeah, well. Exactly. Uh, it's behavior, and it's the lack of content to keep people busy, absolutely. Kinsey, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, that is, of course, uh, Kinsey Schofield, Royal Commentator. Very quick word to Benedict Spence. Um, Martin Bashir, the, 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 I was going to say the Megans, the Sussexes. Actually, I'll be honest with Martin Bashir, I'm very grateful to him because now, if I ever make a mistake and you have a go at me for it, I'm just going to accuse you of anti Catholic bias and I'm going to be able to get away with that's it. That's all you've got to so, use. So thanks, Martin. Not your you've white done me a real privilege. Solid. No, no, no <laughs> that doesn't fly very far.